let's talk about insulin-related errors. People get so used to using insulin, and I hear nurses say, well, you know, it's so little blood, and it's so safe, and I give it all the time. Well, contamination really is a risk. Double dipping in vials is not recommended. You can't draw up insulin and say, oh, wait, no, that's not right, and then put it back in and draw it out. That's not allowable. Insulin pens and cross-contamination is a big deal. Insulin pens appear to the naked eye to be a closed system. And, you know, a lot of times you're putting on the pen and, and people think, okay, that's, you know, here's the pen, here's the needle, not a problem. There's actually a chance, and it happens more frequently than we'd like, that there's a backflow of blood up into that pen. So if you're only using it for one person, you're not going to contaminate anything, but it's not a closed system. You cannot use it for more than one person, and that has happened several times. For example, over 700 patients at a New York hospital were exposed to HIV, hepatitis B, or hepatitis C, all of these things at the same hospital, because they were reusing insulin pens on multiple patients and just changing the disposable needles. At first glance, that seems like, well, why wouldn't that be okay? But now that you know there's a backflow of blood, you know that that's absolutely not okay. And just to give this a little bit more nudge so you understand what I'm saying, if you are working in a long-term care facility, we are now very often caring for baby boomers. Baby boomers are five times more likely than other people to have hepatitis C and not realize it. Hepatitis C could have been contracted due to practices in their youth or in the 80s or 90s when hepatitis C was getting transmitted in blood transfusions and other ways and people weren't really aware, with it, aware of it and it hangs around in the blood for a long time. The other thing about hepatitis C, it can live in a droplet of dried blood for about three weeks on a dried surface. So infectious agents, I want you to be very aware of this, and insulin. More insulin-related errors, residents without diabetes get insulin. And this is either due to error because someone doesn't identify the correct patient, or they have the wrong orders, or we'll get down to the bottom bullet in a second. We'll discuss something that happens more often than I'd like that's an interesting scenario in transitions of care. Insulin-related errors can happen when insulin is mixed incorrectly. You're mixing those insulins that you shouldn't be mixing. When it's stored incorrectly, it can be completely ineffective. Titrated or used incorrectly. Maybe we're titrating it up too rapidly or we're using it incorrectly. We're not giving it at the correct time. We're giving it an hour and a half before a meal and their blood sugar plummets. And then we have hypoglycemia and in some cases a sentinel event, which is a horrible event that causes harm. Now, the wrong patient sometimes gets insulin, which is terrible. There's the wrong order. Maybe the order got changed. If you have people other than yourself giving insulin, let's say that you work in a long-term care facility that's an assisted living facility, and you're a nurse, and there are medication technicians giving these medications, well, they're working under your license. And let's say you forgot to change the order. You were aware the order changed, but you didn't tell them. That happens, and people get the wrong dose. The order's written incorrectly. There's a wrong indication for use. Now, this is the part I was talking about that happens more commonly than I would like, especially during transitions. In hospitals, there are either standing orders for sliding scale just in case they need it, and everybody gets them. Don't love standing orders, but it happens. Or you know that when people become very ill, they sometimes have blood sugar spikes, and they are not diabetic, but they might require a little insulin while they're in the facility. Well, what happens is they get transferred from the hospital facility to your long-term care facility, and that sliding scale order is still on. Well, people look at the sliding scale order, and this, there's numerous case studies on this, and they say, oh, well, this person has diabetes because they're sliding scale. Clearly they have diabetes. I mean, there's no other record anywhere in the chart except for right there, we're just matching the medication order to what we assume to be a diagnosis, and there you go. Now, some people might say, well, if they don't have diabetes, then the hospital sliding scale isn't going to make any difference because their blood sugar is not going to get any higher. 
Well, you know what happens? That someone says, oh, they're on sliding scale, they have diabetes. Most people, as I had mentioned earlier in this presentation, have type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes is very often con controlled by an oral agent. And bam, there you go. They have a sliding scale order, they don't have diabetes, and now they have an oral medication to treat their diabetes that they don't have every day. Their blood sugar plummets, and they are rehospitalized. So this has happened. More insulin-related errors. There is highly concentrated insulin we mentioned in a previous portion of this presentation. Humulin R, so it's regular insulin, but instead of U100, it's U500. It's five times more concentrated. And we use that when dose requirements for a person exceed 200 units per day. That way we're not injecting so much volume, we don't have to split the dose as much, but they can still get their insulin. So you can see that's a useful idea. However, anything that's highly concentrated is certainly a risk for error. Let's talk a little bit about a case. This is an ISMP case. A doctor writes for 25 units of U500 insulin. The prescriber was asked if the order could be changed to U100 concentration instead of U500 for ease of measurement. I want you to think if that makes any sense to you. If it doesn't, you're not alone. Why would someone ask that? Why would you say, well, can we change it to a U100 concentration? They're not asking, can you change it to U100 insulin? They're basically asking you to change the measurement scale. Why is that? Because when they invented U500 insulin, they didn't invent a U500 insulin dosing syringe. I'm not kidding you. So this is fraught with error. What happens is you get these U100 concentration conversions that happen, and we will have a downloadable item for you that does a conversion chart both to an insulin syringe and to a tuberculin syringe if you're using these. But still, it's a very dangerous practice. In this case, an error was made in the subsequent conversion, and too much insulin was administered to the patient. And you can see how that would happen quite easily.